any of you ever have, I'm sure. Now, somebody's going to have to read it. I just can't do that and talk to you. 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, Eutychus who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three, floor, three floors below and was picked up dead. Jeez. But Paul went down and bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comfort. Don't you love when the Bible uses that term sometimes, not a little? Instead of saying greatly, not a little comfort. So they a, a, Paul has been to Troas. This is his third trip there. So he's got some history with these people. He's got some grounded people. And he's trying to help them grow and continue to grow. Now, I've heard a lot of great preachers in my life. Every now and Nancy Wilson, I can listen to you forever and ever. ever. But I don't think I can listen to her all day till midnight. <coughs> Until dawn. That's just not going to happen. But they were so hungry to understand it all. Remember again, it was brand new. They would not heard all this stuff. So you've got this kid, Eutychus. The way they refer to him, he was probably 12, 13 years old. Why well, he might be sitting in the window because of all those lamps were going, those oil lamps, probably a little bit smoky in there. He falls asleep. Now, as a teenager, when this was preached on, they would give us these real strict things to make fall asleep. You might fall out of the window. Maybe out the balcony. But we were going to be three floors up for sure. And it's interesting because when he falls, in many translations it says that Paul threw himself on him. Um, went on and he fell asleep and Paul stretched himself on him. There's a couple of places in the Old Testament where Elijah would do that when people had died. And I've heard people talk about maybe it was some form of CPR or just a plain old miracle, but there was something about that contact that brought these people back to life. I think it's interesting that that didn't break up the service. They eventually took him on home, and they kept listening to Paul. I can't imagine being that hungry to learn something. But I think we've gotten kind of numb to those sort of things over the years, because we've heard sermon after sermon, Bible study after Bible study. It's interesting to know that Eutychus' name means lucky one. I wonder if he was falling down those three floors. I'm kind of guessing he probably came away. I wonder if he thought he was very lucky in that. One of the questions when I was studying this came, well, why is the story even in there? Why did they tell him that this teenager falls asleep and fall down the land? A lot of places in the Bible go, why did they put that in there? What lessons do you think they might want people to get? Obviously, I'm falling asleep in church at that window. Okay, we got that. What else? Falling asleep in church isn't the worst thing in the world. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. And there's, in Greece, there's a bunch of words for sleep. There's sleep like falling asleep in a natural way. There's another word for sleep that means like falling into a hypnosis. And there's another word for sleep that refers to the dead. Remember in 1 Thessalonians, you've heard me use at funerals, those that are dead will rise, and, you know, and, and those that are asleep will rise. And so, okay, this was a case of just plain old sleep. I also wonder, though, if some of that hypnosis might have come into it. Have you ever heard preachers that went on and on and on and you kind of get hypnotized while asleep? That never happened to a Troy's preacher, let me tell you. But the story was there. I think there's a couple of things to show that they were still meeting on the first day of the week. So when they were coming together for communion, which is what the first eating implies, it shows how eager they were to learn. And then somebody brought potluck. So they got to have other food through the night. I can't imagine they had communion all night. I like grape juice, but not that much. So again, a story that shows how the early church was dealing with issues. And the early church was dealing with. So who's the best preacher you've ever heard that you would like to listen to again and again? 
He's always wanting to know how we're doing, if everything's okay, do we need anything? Especially when Joanna had a heart attack. And when I told her Joanna had gone back to work, she said, well, thank God. And I was on the phone, and I went, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not, but somewhere along the line, not that we've been preaching to her, but somewhere along the line, she had picked that up. And it may have just been a casual saying, but it made me feel good that she at least was giving God the thanks for that. So Paul keeps going back to the temple. And it's interesting that it wasn't just a little few people. Unless the writer was being greatly exaggerated, he says the whole city was aroused. You ever been to a Billy Graham crusade? Anybody ever been to a Billy Graham crusade? They had one in Schwartzville, in Tower, Norfolk. And they had churches all over that area involved in it. And the Coliseum was just packed. Now, there were protesters and all that. But I have never seen quite that many people excited about the Lord. And I thought, man, I'm glad I'm glad on their side. Because it would be a scary place to be in the midst of all that. He also, the whole city was there, which means words getting around, free, free advertising. And we're going to find out in a few minutes why it's important that the Romans were trying to say Paul. The Romans were trying to say Paul. Look at the next couple of verses, 22 to 29. I'll try to read those. I mean, uh, yeah, 20, chapter 22, 22 to 29. I'll hang on with you. My brain's not working. The people in the crowd had listened attentively up to this point. But now they broke loose, shouting, kill him. He's an insect. Stomp on him. They shook their fists. They filled the air with curses. <coughs> That's when the captain intervened in order to call be take to the be taken to the barracks. But now the captain was thoroughly exasperated. He decided to interrogate Paul under torture in order to get to the bottom of this. And he just keeps breaking out. He's always having to send his, his cops out after them. Find out what he'd done to provoke this outrage, outrage violence. As they spread eagled him with top thongs, getting him ready for the whip, Paul said to the centurion sitting next to him there, Is this legal, torturing a Roman citizen without a fair trial? When the centurion heard this, he went directly to the captain. Do you realize what you've done? This man is a Roman citizen. The captain came back and took charge. Is what I hear right? You're a Roman citizen? Paul says, I certainly am. The captain was impressed. I paid a huge sum for my citizenship. How much did it cost you? Nothing, said Paul. It cost me nothing. I was free from the day of my birth. Paul was not in Rome, he was in the areas outside of Rome, in Jerusalem. And he, they're really upset, he's causing so much trouble. He doesn't just come into town, create a hassle, and then leave. Every time he gets out of jail, he goes back out in the public, starts talking about the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me, and people get upset again. I guess the cops were getting a little frustrated. So he says, I'm going to find out about this. Notice he didn't ask anything first. He was going to torture him first, and then ask questions. And we've seen enough of those Bible movies to know what it means when it says spread evil out, get ready to lash him. Paul was no dummy. He hadn't shared this little piece of information until it was very necessary. And he says to the centurion, to the Roman guard there, I don't think you could whip a, a Roman citizen without a trial. I bet those guys dropped those whips in a quick minute. Because if they had done that, they then could have been killed. They then could have been killed. Now what's interesting here, there weren't such things as birth certificates. You know? When I travel, when I go to conference next week, I've already decided I'm taking my birth certificate with me. Now, I just do that because I don't want to be in any hassle at any time. Somebody won't know if I'm a citizen. Doesn't take anything to tuck that in. But they didn't have anything like that. Paul simply said, I'm a Roman citizen. I've always wondered how they knew that. Why did they believe that? Unless he just had that authority. And people could buy their citizenship. The centurion was probably Jewish. But he had bought his Roman citizenship and paid a lot of money for it. <coughs> and he asked Paul, how much did you pay? Probably think it was a whole lot more because he was just a scraggly little preacher man. What did it mean 
parents, the Roman father. Again, I always wondered, who says? Who says that? Would he have just claimed that? Did he have a mark on him? He was circumcised, so he could pass as a Jew, too. You know? For whatever reason, they believed him, and that's the important part. And then the chapter 24, 23 gets investigated by some other folks. And finally, he gets transferred to Caesarea. And there's all kinds of letters going back and forth about him. And he comes to trial before Felix. You know, the Romans had all these levels, like we do. State court, district court, Supreme Court. They had all these levels. And now he's getting near the top. He's standing his ground. And he goes through lots and lots of explanation about who he is. Now, again, when I was studying this this week, I thought, well, who in the world didn't know who Paul was by now? Did you know how many times the book of Acts he gives his testimony? There used to be a thing out when I was in college that said, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about that one for a minute. And I've often wondered what kind of testimony we could give for how God came alive in our life. We don't do a whole lot of that anymore. We used to do, if you were in the Baptist church, you had to get this visitation, you go out and knock on doors, invite people to church, and tell them your experience. Is anybody willing to tell us the first time they realized God loved them? First time it became real for them? Among friends. Well, we let's not get arrested. All right, let's look at this. Yeah, like, um, <coughs> huh? I don't have a story. I was really young. I mean, yeah. I was a little tiny person. And I don't even remember if I had been to church by then. I just kind of did. Mm -hmm. You know, there were other times in life when maybe I had not been a good person or something like that and yet something very nice happened or something. And that was to me like God saying, I still love you. Mm -hmm. So it was things like that. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's really nice. You know, when I taught in Christian schools, they bring in these people to speak. I remember they brought one guy in one time, he'd been a mafia leader. And he told all these awful stories about the rots and all this stuff. And this one kid came back to my class and he was just in tears. And I said, what's wrong, honey? He said, I don't think I'll ever be bad enough to be saved. Because he heard all these stories about these awful, terrible people and how Jesus came to their life and saved them. I said, Thank goodness, you don't need to go through that to have God love you. <laughs> and many times we don't have a Damascus Road experience. We come to see it and understand it. Like Kathy said, for me it's been an ongoing thing. You know, I knew it when I started going to Sunday school when I was three, three and a half. But it's become more real over the years as I've seen God get me through various situations and various times. It's also been the times when God and I have been really mad at one another. I thought of God how mad I was. You know? And to see that God stayed with me <coughs> through those times also. Let's look at Paul's testimony. It's a little long here, but I think we need to see how he explained himself so that maybe we can take some things from that. I'm going to read one to four and then somebody else pick up for a few verses. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea to some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. Now these are the Jewish leaders who are taking the charges to the Roman court. When Paul was called in, Tertullius presented his case before Felix. We've enjoyed a long period of peace under you and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge, this was with, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Okay, now he's sucking up to the oppressors. Okay, the Romans had the Jewish people under their thumb. And can you hear the syrup in that? We've just done so well under you. Now, if you will just hear us briefly. I'm going to like to read 5 through 9. 
We found this man time and again disturbing the peace, stirring up riots against Jews all over the world, the ringleader of a seditious sect called Nazarenes. He's a real bad apple, I must say. We caught him trying to defile our holy temple and arrested him. You'll be able to verify all these accusations when you examine him yourself. The Jews joined in, hear, hear, that's right. Okay, so now he's, he's I love how the exaggeration, did you hear exaggeration of that? He stirred up riots among Jews all over the world. <laughs> all over the world, a little extreme. And he's a ringleader of that Nazarene sect, that Jesus group. He's one of the ringleaders, that's true. And I'm not quite sure why they thought he'd try to desecrate the temple. I guess because he was saying they weren't maybe using it the best way possible. And then all the Jews that were there were like, yeah, 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 right. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, this is why it's always good, folks, if you think you're going to be in a position to have to talk for the Lord, speak up about the Lord, you can have some points on in your mind. Many years ago, CBM was going to interview the pastor of the Norfolk Church. And Jim Downing was petrified. He was literally shaking. I don't know what I'll say. And I shared with him a verse where the disciples were taught to always be ready to give an account of the hope that is within them. When people ask you about your walk with the Lord and you can be Christian or anything else, they're not asking for a 12-volume theological discussion. What they really want to hear is your story. How God touched you made your life the way it is. How God gave you the assurance. So Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you've been judge of this nation, so I gladly make your defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple, or starting up a crowd in the synagogue, or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you <coughs> the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of your fathers and mothers as a follower of the way. Remember that was the early name for the church? Which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and it is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God that these people, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and people. Paul has a little bit of Perry Mason in it. Combined with a little bit of Jack Webb with Dragnet. Just facts. He admits to being there. And he admits that he, you know, has been in the temple worship. But he's not been trying to stir everybody up. He even says to Felix, who's a Roman leader, I pretty much believe everything they believe. Sort of. After an absence of several years, Paul says, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. There are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state the crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was the one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you now. Explains to Felix, I didn't come in, you know, we've talked before about the unclean to go in the temple. You know, he was cleaned up, he was dressed, he was doing all the right things. He brought sacrifices. <coughs> He's saying there are people who can speak directly to that, but they're not there. Don't you love how calm he is? I know some of you all, you've been up in their face saying, I didn't do that, that's not true. And Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, well acquainted with the Christians, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysia, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to take Paul 
under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. That was still a bit like Felix is saying that I was upset with him when he refused wanting to be. When you hear about Paul being in prison all the time, he wasn't in prison like down the street locked up. Many times he was under house arrest. Many times people could come in, if you read the other little good books, book he was in some of those, people could come in and write for him. People could come in and visit him. And here's Felix, the head of the Roman government, if you will, saying, yeah, yeah, I'm keeping, but go easy on him. Let his friends come and take care of him. <coughs> Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Priscilla. Or I 
against the temple or against Caesar. That's probably one of the shortest comments about Paul anywhere in the book of Acts or in the other books. He doesn't go through defending himself. He doesn't go through tearing apart their decisions. Sometimes one simple statement is enough. I've been asked many times by people from my past, how in the world can you be gay and Christian? And they don't want to hear a whole workshop like last on Saturday. I just say, because she's supposed to. Now, if they want to talk more, but there's no use in going on and on and on about it. That's just wishing to do the Jews a favor. Man, everybody's trying to stay on the good side of them. Mm -hmm. Said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me? Before me, there are these charges. Paul said, I'm now standing before Caesar's court for I to be tried. I've not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing something deserving death, I do not refuse to die. For the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. I confess this <coughs> and confer this counsel and declare, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Most commentaries feel like that Paul, if he did not mean this appeal, that's just what we've let him go. We've let him go. Get him out of town on one of the ways they do that. <coughs> but once he said, you know, like on TV, if you get arrested, once you say, I want a lawyer, lawyer everything stops. So when Paul said, yeah, I want to go talk to Caesar, everything stopped. Now you can, you can look at all these different ways of that help the work get out further. Help the word to be spread. We don't know what Paul might have been able to do. And he might have been killed by the Jews as soon as he got let loose. They were determined to stop him. They were determined to stop him. <coughs> and I would love to keep going to the word tonight. I'm sorry you've only been out here for a half hour, but I don't think I can do much more. So before next week, if you'll look over chapters 25, 26, 27. Let's look at just one place real quick. Chapter 26, verse 19. This is Paul dealing with Agrippa. 26, verse 19. What can I do, King Agrippa? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. Remember the vision Paul had? I, be I became an obedient believer on the spot. I started preaching this life-changing, this radical turn to God. And everything it meant in everyday life, right there in Damascus, went on to Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside, and from there to the whole world. <coughs> Again, a little bit of exaggeration. I just want to say the whole known world. Because of this whole world dimension that the Jews ratted me in the temple that day and tried to kill me. They want to keep God to themselves, but God has stood by me just as God promised. And I'm standing here saying that I'm the same to anyone, whether king or child, who will listen. And everything I'm saying is completely in line with what the prophets and Moses what, what said would happen. One, the Messiah must die. Two, raised from the dead. He would become the first rays of God's daylight shining on people far and near. People with godless and god fearing. That was too much for Festus. He interrupted with a shout, Paul, you're crazy. You've read too many books, spent too much time staring off into space. Get a grip on yourself and get back to the real world. <coughs> but Paul stood his ground. With all respect, Festus, your honor, I'm not crazy. I'm both accurate and the same in what I'm saying. The king knows what I'm talking about. I'm sure that nothing of what I said sounded crazy to him. He's known all about it for a long time. You must realize this wasn't done behind the scenes. You believe the prophets told you, King Agrippa. Don't answer that. I know what you believe. Once again, when somebody started standing up for themselves and talking about the Lord, the first reaction of Festus was, you're crazy. Crazy. Now, he could have thought he was crazy because he was pushing the limit. Sometimes you have to tell no one told him what he said before. But he was pushing the limit. Paul knows that word has gotten around by this time. Paul knows by this time, anybody in the whole world has heard this message. And if they've really been listening, then they understand that he's not saying anything weird or crazy. 
when I was making notes for this, uh, my little section about it, crazy for Jesus. Did anybody think they were crazy because we were involved with the church and the Lord? I see a little nod there. When I first got involved with MCC, all my Baptist friends thought I joined uh, a, uh, a commune. Oh, a cult, that's the word I wanted. Joined a cult. And I said, well, I'm not going to you can say, oh, no, I'm not going in there. I've got something you can read. Oh, no, I'm not going to that. And they really thought that I had joined a cult. I've had another person who, back in the days when I was doing people's clergy, we had to be at the church two nights a week, besides Wednesday night, to cover the office. And one of my co-workers at the library said, do you do anything other than go to church? I said, well, not a whole lot. <laughs> but it was what I wanted to be doing at that time. And when you're doing what you want to be doing, and when you're going to do what God wants you to do, it's hard to be crazy. It's hard to be crazy. Comments, thoughts? I'm going to finish up the story about Paul. And what's really sad is we don't know the whole story. That's the frustrating thing. It's another one of those. You, get to, you ever get to the end of the book, you go, what happened to in movies especially, they'll tell you about somebody, and you get the end of the movie, what happened to that person? They got cut. They got cut out. So we'll hear what we can about Paul in this week. Any last minute prayer requests or praises? May God send us out here to keep us safe as the rains come through at various times. Help us to be ready just in case this week somebody says to us, do you think God really loves you? You think God can love me? And help us to know in our heart of hearts that the answer is purely.